Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Katie Smoller. I am the Director of Educational Programs here with the National History Academy. And today we are continuing our tour through different historic sites across the country. And we are going to Chicago, Illinois today. And we are joined by Park Ranger Grace Cruz from the Pullman National Monument. So Grace, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm excited, excited to be here. Hi, great. And Gracie, you're free to share your screen if you'd like, and we'll get going. All right, everyone. So welcome to Pullman National Monument. As Katie mentioned, we are located in Chicago, Illinois. We are one of Chicago's only um, national park sites, and I'm excited to show you our site today. Um, as you can see from this picture, you're seeing that our visitor center, which was in 1881, the administration building for the Pullman Company. Um, but before we dive into that history, I just want to uh, let you know that our site is a little unique. Um, and starting with our sign, you could sort of tell that um, we are both a national park site and a state historic site. So um, we are one of the newer national park sites. So if you haven't heard of us before, if you have heard of us before, um, just send a little heart in the chat if you have heard of Pullman. Um, and if you haven't, well, that's why you're here. Um, so in 2015, former President Barack Obama designated us a national park site. We are located on the far south side of Chicago. We are practically almost um, in Indiana. We're around 25 minutes away from the border of Indiana. And we are an urban park and that presents us with exciting opportunities uh, to reach a broader range of audiences, but also tell a really unique story. So um, we are in this administration and clock tower building that's our main visitor center but our monument boundaries are quite large it's um one destination with many different places our boundaries stretch all the way north to 153rd street and south all the way here to 115th street um we're around uh, two miles so we are still a pedestrian centered uh, monument. So you could technically walk the entire monument boundaries. Um, but to kind of show you the little nuances of our site, everything in blue um, you could see is owned by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Um, we, the National Park Service, just owns the clock tower building. That's the only land we own. The other land that you're seeing is a Chicago Historic District and a historic landmark district as well. So we are based out of the first floor here of the Pullman Clock Tower and Administration Building. That's kind of one of the main iconic buildings um, that you could find within Pullman National Monument, besides the homes and um, former building amenities of the town of Pullman. So what's the big picture? <laughs> Uh, this is a historic photo of our clock tower building here and you could see that there used to be an artificial lake this does not look like the city of chicago and that's because it wasn't in 1881 this was not a part of chicago it was around depending on where you were in chicago around nine miles outside of the city border and there is a reason for that and that's because of a man named George Mortimer Pullman's vision, and his vision was making luxury rail cars. So on my screen right here to the right, we see what this town was known for. George Pullman made luxury rail cars. Um, this was the main export of the company. He didn't make any, um, engines, it was mainly just passenger rail cars that George Pullman would then sell to railroads to have the privilege of carrying that on their line. Um, but George Pullman 
realized, well, I want to make these luxury rail cars, but I want to have a centralized shop here in Chicago. I already have some centralized uh, locations in Detroit, but I need to expand. Um, so he would move operations to Chicago in 1881. Um, but on top of that, besides just building rail cars, he would then go into the business of running a whole town for workers that made these rail cars. Um, but we're not just a railroad um, park. We are, or a manufacturing park. We're also a civil rights park as well. And that comes into a play with our Pullman porters who were also Pullman employees. They were the service personnel on board these luxury rail cars there. Um, we kind of refer to these four components of making manufacturing rail cars, the workers who lived here, the homes that George Pullman made and the Pullman porters as kind of a Pullman experiment. So to start off this experiment, uh, we have to go back to rail cars. Of course, you could all think of a time where you have ridden on a rail car. And if you ever have, then you have the Pullman company to thank for some of those amenities that you found on board and some of those safety features. Remember, um, this is in the 1800s and trains are the name of the transportation game. This is after the Civil War and George Pullman sees a market uh, for expanding into making these luxury rail cars. Um, now, luxury rail cars weren't anything new. There was a high volume market for them, but George Pullman was the best at making these rail cars. And hence, uh, we tend to remember his name instead of maybe some of his competitors like the Wagner Company. So what did these Pullman cars look like? Well, inside opulence and luxury could be some names that you could use. As you see from the pictures here, we have lush, plush interiors, great seating, stained glass, chandeliers, and fine wood carving. Um, we see here on the left, during the day, passengers can travel in safety, comfort, and style. And then at night, these upper um, portions of the car would pull down and transform the car into beds. Hence, we get the name sleeping cars. Um, but Pullman was a very shrewd businessman. He knew that I just can't make uh, sleeping cars for the public. I would also make lounge cars, gambling cars, kitchen cars, as well as, of course, the meat and potatoes, freight cars, and flat cars. And why was this so important? Well, rail travel in the 1800s was not fun. Um, a lot of people experienced uncomfortable long journeys like this picture here. Um, looking at this picture, we can tell this does not look comfortable. Some might say airplane travel today is what this reminds them of. And so George Pullman, what he was offering, comfortable amenities and consistently exceptional um, customer service was unprecedented. George Pullman's company would become a model for luxury, both in the United States and internationally. So knowing that the American public is just hungry for great experience on board rail, the railways, George Pullman, like we said, moves his operations, adds operations from his shops in Detroit to Pullman, Illinois, which today, of course, is Chicago. And this was gonna be a mass centralized manufacturing site. Here you can see we have our clock tower building, but this was just the aesthetic screen that really flanked all the industry that was going on behind here. Pullman wanted everything in one place, so he would co-locate his suppliers, like the Paper Allen Wheel Company to the site, as well as raw materials, such as wood shops, laundry, seamstress shops, repair shops, as well as gas works and foundry works as well. Um, this was what the front of the building used to look like. Pretty neat. Um, can you think of maybe a company headquarters that looks this beautiful? And it was no accident that Pullman wanted to design something that was aesthetically pleasing. 
his rail cars were opulent and so his factory would be a representation of his luxury sleeping cars. Um, so here is our, just to review our clock tower where our visitor center is today. Um, and then of course, Lake Vista, which was an artificial lake that Pullman went to uh, build in front of the clock tower. The bays that you see here are additional manufacturing bays, but so far it looks pretty good. Um, Pullman had a massive operation here that required a large number of skilled and unskilled workers. Just as Pullman cars became synonymous with luxury, Pullman's name would also come to represent innovations in manufacturing. Pullman had an assembly line like procedure for developing these rail cars. And remember, this is during the 18, late 1800s. And while we associate a, another entrepreneur in Detroit with the assembly line method, Henry Ford, <laughs> Pullman was already doing this stuff uh, as, as soon as 1881 at his factory site. So here you see um, a rail car in the beginning stages where they would build the steel frame. Originally, these would have been wood, but later by the 1900s, it's starting to convert into mainly steel components. So you see um, the steel component of the car here and the cars would be shuttled to the various bays for completion. Here you see a more completed Pullman car being rolled out of a bay here onto this transfer table. And this transfer table would take the cars via this little half car or donkey car and would push them along uh, to the various bays for completion. Now, as we mentioned, Pullman needed a large set of workers. He wanted to attract the best workers and retain them as well. So in order to do this though, Pullman had to think outside the box. And the way he did this was addressing um, the ills of cities. So this is a picture of Randolph Street, Chicago, 1890. It looks a little wild, it looks pretty congested. And Pullman saw that conditions of cities were negatively impact, sorry. Okay, were negatively impacting his ability to attract and retain workers. That if I give workers a great environment to live in, then, then they won't wanna leave and I will avoid the problems that cities have with their workers, such as uh, worker unrest or workers needing, feeling the need to join a union. To highlight some of those labor tensions going on during that time. Um, this center here of Randolph Street has a statue. There's no trees, there's no greenery like how we expect our cities to look like today. Um, but this statue is in dedication to uh, police officers fallen in the Haymarket riot, which as we know, Pullman didn't want to avoid. So, Pullman solution, if cities are the problem, then I'm gonna just build my own town. I'm already located outside of the city. There's ample space to kind of create this blank slate. Hence we say kind of Pullman's experiment to see how we can have both a blended manufacturing site with a residential area. Now, company towns aren't anything new. You could probably think of some off the top of your head and those images might not be very positive, but Pullman was trying to do something different with his town by making an elevated environment for workers to live in. And once again, this was gonna represent him and his company. So it had to be the best. So Pullman set to work and he hired three architects, Solon Beeman to design the homes, Nathaniel Barrett to design the landscape, and Benzette Williams to take care of the sanitary needs of the town. No matter what type of worker you were, skilled or unskilled, executive or um, low wage earner, you could expect almost the same kind of amenities within the town. All homes, as you can see here, were made out of brick. They had indoor plumbing and proper ventilation. This wasn't always available to working class folks on the American market at that time. And in turn, this 
would attract workers from not only the United States, but internationally as well. A lot of Pullman workers were immigrants themselves from England, Sweden, Eastern Europe, Germany as well, just to name a few. So below here, you kind of get a scope of how large um, Pullman's town was. So I can't just build homes and have a job for my workers. I need to provide amenities. And some of those amenities were a church, a grocery store, the arcade building, which was multi-layered and was the center of their commerce district. It had a bank, post office, library, dry goods store, as well as a theater, as well as a hotel, Florence, which is currently owned by the state of Illinois, as well as green spaces. Pullman's careful planning of the town would influence later city planners into incorporating green spaces and athletic opportunities within their cityscapes. But although there was great amenities like the homes and a pleasing environment for workers to live in, there was still some tensions underneath the surface here. Um, first and foremost, workers did not own their homes. They leased their homes from the Pullman Company. And it was here that the Pullman Company started to run into some issues of the blending of landlord and employer proved to be a tripping point. This came to a head in 1894. In 1894, Pullman workers decided to go on strike. This was because starting in 1893, as the Pullman's company was showcased at the World's Fair, uh, the United States was entering their version of the Great Depression. So in response to this, George Pullman starts to cut wages and hours at the factory site. However, he did not lower the rents in the town. And this kind of caught workers off guard. Um, they felt squeezed as this kind of cartoon shows between low wages and high rent. Um, Pullman workers tried to approach the company and un they were unsuccessful in negotiating um, a lowering of the rents. So left with the only choice they felt they had left, they decided to go on strike in 1894. It took them that long to make that hard decision. Because remember, this is during a depression. Um, people are willing to take your job if you don't want to work. But the vote to strike happened nonetheless. While this could have stayed as a small local strike in Chicago and could have forgot, be forgotten about in the history books, um, there was another group of workers that joined Pullman employees in their strike, and that was the American Railroad Union, led by Eugene Debs. This was a new union on the block that sought to include both skilled and unskilled workers. This was a lot different from previous unions that were um, limited by your skill set. If you're not a, you know, engine locomotive engineer, you can't be in our union. But the ARU opened their membership up to both skilled and unskilled workers, and thus they were growing in power. So by the American Railroad Union joining uh, Pullman workers, they said that any rail car that passed through their station that had a Pullman car attached to it, because remember Pullman is leasing out his rail cars to the railroad companies. They would not pull any switches for it. They won't inspect it. And if one of them gets knocked off the job, then they're walking off the job as well. So you could imagine this was super disruptful. Um, interstate commerce is coming to a standstill. Uh, US mail isn't getting through and people are sitting up and taking notice. Um, we would definitely notice if the internet went down or even when we were experiencing mail delays in previous years, you definitely noticed. So the Grover Cleveland administration was increasingly worried and sat up and took notice. They said, what's happening? Interstate commerce is disrupted. The US mail isn't getting through and there's some violence breaking out against railroad property. This has to stop. So the Cleveland administration orders an injunction against the American Railroad Union. They tell Eugene Debs to stop striking activities. Eugene Debs did not stop 
and he was subsequently thrown in jail and National Guard troops were sent into Pullman to tamp down the strike. Um, who wasn't a part of a, the strike? Pullman porters. These were the service personnel on board the Pullman trains. And the American Railroad Union was only open to white railroad workers. However, taking that discrimination, the Pullman porters would form their own union, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, and be led by a Philip Randolph, would be one of the first African-American unions recognized by the American Federation of Labor. Um, while the strike didn't accomplish everyone's goals, it did bring about some positives. First and foremost, it gave us the holiday of Labor Day and made that a federal holiday. Um, but also, while workers didn't come out exactly successful, George Pullman didn't come out in triumph either. Um, his health and reputation took a hit. And a few years after his death, the Supreme Court of Illinois stepped in and forced the company to divest from the town. With this divestment, workers were finally able to purchase the homes they had once only rented and have a greater say in their communities. Um, so we could kind of see um, it really took people to make a difference. Of course, the Pullman Company did survive the strike, but as more modes of transportation became more preferred, like airplanes and cars, um, the Pullman Company eventually came to an end. Um, but our story doesn't end there. Um, in the late 90s, although the Pullman Company had closed, um, the clock tower building caught on fire. Um, and while this destroyed the monument, as we know it today, um, it galvanized people to further save and continue to tell the stories of Pullman. Hence, we get our visitor center here and in 2015 being designated a national monument because there was already folks here doing the work of telling the stories like the Pullman Civic Organization, the Historic Pullman Foundation and the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Pullman's greatest asset are its people that continue to tell the stories that matter most here and be stewards of their national monument. Okay, so I think we could open up our, our um, for our session. Great, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I know we've got a bunch of questions. So uh, we're gonna bring on Ben Kellerhulse now. He is our intern with National History Academy and he's gonna help us out with the Q&A. Hi, Grace and hi everyone. That was an awesome presentation. I just wanna say, firstly, I'm taken aback by the sort of um, characters of American history that all <laughs> interacted here. Eugene Deb, say Philip Randolph, that's, that's awesome. So let's see here. Um, first question. Um, what influenced President Obama to choose Pullman as the Chicago historic site to preserve? Yeah, so Pullman, um, moving it from the historic uh, National Registry to a national park site, um, really because of its significance on the national scale. So we have our civil rights connection here with uh, the Pullman Porters and building the black middle class and being a part of the civil rights movement. Um, you had its impact on the transportation industry. Every time you walk on a train, um, some of the safety features you find were pioneered and used by the Pullman Company. Um, so both not just our country, but internationally, um, Pullman's presence is why President Obama designated us a national park site. Michelle Obama's um, is related to a Pullman porter that helped, that really um, speaks to that building of the black middle class. And also a shout out to our uh, partner, the National A. Philip Randolph Pullman Porter Museum that's solely dedicated to telling um, that Porter story. Wow, yeah, and that's, that's awesome. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I guess the one that's building on something you mentioned there, what is it like as a site and uh, now an uh, NPS historic site to talk about these diverse histories? Are people surprised or visitors surprised when they come and they learn that all of this is there? Do you have any yes. trouble because of how politicized history is now? How is that experience? Um, you know, Pullman can deal with uncomfortable topics like discrimination um, that the Pullman porters faced. 
uh, or the the tensions that workers had with their employer, the Pullman Company, um, but it's stories that need to be told. And it's great that we're not just a nature park. We're not just a train park. We have all these tracks that lead into our lives today. Immigration, workers' rights. These are headlines that we could look at in the news today. Urban planning, how we want our cities to look. The move back to pedestrian-centric city planning. Pullman's done all that. And we can be a great example and lessons learned um, for if ever Google or Amazon decides to uh, build their own towns for their workers. Yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, it's funny to think about the difference between um, these sort of companies then and these sorts of companies now. Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, where is that? Oh yeah. so. When it comes to the Pullman porters and that and the unionizing efforts and these sorts of things, um, and I know myself as well have heard the Pullman porters referenced in um, protest songs, union songs from around the country. Um, how did this provide an example for workers' rights movements and anti-discrimination movements around the country? I think it provides an example to show the resilience. Uh, Pullman porters faced incredible obstacles to unionizing. They weren't included in part of the ARU. Um, they knew their value and they knew that they wanted to be in a workplace that was uh, fair to them for the work they were doing. Um, Pullman Porters put in grueling hours in, ter in tough working conditions. And so, um, I think their biggest story is preservation. Obviously the, um, the efforts of the Pullman company to resist their unionization and the role that the women's auxiliary played in helping porters, uh, the wives of porters helping them form their union and take their votes so they wouldn't be fired for going to a union meeting and being able to cast their vote uh, is incredibly inspiring. Yeah, it surely is, it surely is. Um... What kind of uh, artifacts might the site have? Are there any Pullman cars that are still intact and <laughs> presented, anything like that? Yeah, so currently we do not own a Pullman car, but we do have a cutaway to experience um, a Pullman rail car and to um, feel that luxury. We do have a set of dining plates on loan to us that you could find in the Pullman cars. And hopefully um, some of our partners might be able to acquire a Pullman car in the future because uh, to see that craftsmanship really speaks to the workers that made that possible as well. Nice. Um, let's see. This is similar to a, a previous question, but still a good one because we see here through a lot of the sites that we visit virtually or in person um, how this can be done differently. How does the site work to tell individual stories uh, that make up a full history that account for everyone that's there, like you've touched on in the presentation? Yeah, so we are blessed to have a lot of partners help us tell that story. Um, we have a Pullman at Home project that will feature workers and they took they found worker stories and they will uh, showcase some of the homes in the neighborhood because a lot of the neighborhood does still have a lot of the original homes and buildings. So allowing for that um, space for our partners. Uh, it's so heartwarming to have so many stakeholders that care about the monument and want to see it succeed. I hope that, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, that might be it for, for questions from the chat and such, but we always like to end with asking our great guides at these sites, um, maybe how you got to where you are and if you had any advice for someone who's interested in having a job like yours. Of course. So I started, of course, volunteering. Our volunteers give so much to our parks. And so I started volunteering in college and I realized that this is something I want to do. Of course, there's a lot of different pathways. You don't have to have a degree in uh, recreation management. Of course, mine's in history and environmental education, um, but I've worked with amazing coworkers um, 
that have such diverse backgrounds. My coworker, I could think the Amber, who uh, has an archaeology, preservation, public history um, degree, as well as my coworker that has her um, doctorate in English. So it just as as diverse as our national park sites are, so too can um, your experience level be. National parks need all sorts of people from law enforcement, uh, visual information specialists to interpreters like me um, that help tell the story. So there's really, um, I would say volunteering and just trying to connect either virtually or in person uh, with your national park. Cause you might not live close to a national park but reach out to them and see what kind of virtual opportunities they have as well as in person. Great, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all that with us. We truly, truly appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, looking forward to visit in person. And thank you everyone back home for joining in with us. We'll be back here next week, same time as we virtually visit with the Mary McLeod Bethune Council House National Historic Site. And I hope to see you there. Have a wonderful rest of your day. All right, thank you.